40 days in Brentwood will be overthrown. 40 days in Brentwood will be overthrown. Well, what a powerful teaching today that we just had, <laughs> right? It was very short, concise, a little ambiguous, but as we wrap up our teaching today, I want you to remember in 40 days, Brentwood will be over to actually, we're in our Jonah series and Jonah preaches this seven word message, five words in Hebrew, and put your hands together for Pastor Jason as he teaches on this message. Some of you were like, well, that's different. <laughs> Time for lunch. No. As we've been in this study in the book of Jonah, if you're new with us, this is not a normal beginning to a sermon. We've been going to this book called Jonah. And in this book of Jonah, Jonah today, literally his entire sermon, his entire teaching to Nineveh is five words in Hebrew, seven words in English. And somehow God uses these seven words of in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown and God uses them to change an entire city. And this wasn't a small city. Like if you understand, Nineveh was like seven miles in circumference. It was massive for that time in the ancient world. Uh, it was a cosmopolitan city. It was, had all sorts of just incredible, innovative things going on there. It was incredibly violent as well, but it was this massive city. And Jonah brings this very pointed, very hard word, but somehow it landed on their hearts in a way that was transformational. Have you ever had a hard truth spoken to you that you needed to hear? A moment where it kind of hits you and you're like, ah, that, that wasn't easy to listen to, but I actually needed that. It, it wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it was what I needed to hear. I know I've had that in my own life. I can think of a couple moments. There's many, but there was one where I had been married for about four months to my beautiful wife, Heather, and I was at a, a intern at a church, and I was at a prayer meeting. I was at the front just praying and seeking God, and I get a little tap on my shoulder, and it was the executive pastor there. His name's Andy, and he said, Jason, what is wrong with you? And I'm thinking, what did I, like, my, like is like my, my back showing too much? Like, what's going on? Like, I, I was kind of like, what, what's happening? And he goes, why are you not praying with your wife? He goes, I've been watching you since you guys got married. You're off doing your own thing. You're a married man. Take care of loving on your wife and praying with her and encouraging her in her journey with Jesus as well. And it was oh, a gut punch, but it was true because he was bringing correction. It was a word I needed to hear, even though I didn't want to hear it. I think of another time when I was on staff and we got done with the staff meeting I was leading. I walked out and thinking, that's a good meeting. Got a lot accomplished. And one of our team members pulls me aside and goes, can I talk to you? I was like, sure. You know, you kind of come across harsh sometimes. You, uh, I mean, I, it's kind of hard for some people to take what, how, you, how you approach certain things. And I'm, what do we do sometimes to defend? I'm like, well, that's just how God made me. I'm blunt. I'm honest. It's true, right? They're just sensitive. And after a little bit of time of finally listening, that hard word was true. I needed to see where people were coming from and speak the language of the people around me and learn how to have more tact in the way I communicated things. For you, maybe it was that moment where you read a verse of scripture and, and you knew it was time for something to change. Maybe it was a friend who confronted you about something that you had been struggling with. Maybe you were aware of it or maybe not aware of it and, and you recognize, wow, there needs to be an adjustment in my life. It could be a teaching you heard. It could have been a really hard moment where you kind of hit rock bottom and all of a sudden things become very clear. We know from the scripture, from the Bible, that that's called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit convicts us when we're heading a certain direction and God wants to course correct and adjust us so that we're going the way that God's called us to. And here's the beautiful part about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's an equal opportunity revealer. <laughs> so whether you're a follower of Jesus here today or whether you have, have never followed Christ and you're kind of interested in the claims of Christ, the Holy Spirit has a way of reminding us, preparing our heart and bringing us to truth that transforms us from the inside out. And what's really interesting is if we look back on our moments in our life, have you ever noticed that as you look back, you can kind of see how God was setting you up in a good way? 
preparing you for that change that needed to happen, setting the table for you to make that decision you needed to make. The same thing is true of the city of Nineveh. And that moment that we call that moment where the change takes place is called repentance. In the Hebrew, in our passage today, the term literally has this connotation of turning away from that which is destructive, that which is against God's purpose, and, and having a change of mind so that your actions now are choosing to go the way of God. It's repentance. What's interesting is that historically we know, historians tell us that the nation of Assyria, which is where Nineveh is found, that they had had earthquakes and famine and revolt, and they had had uh, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, all leading up to when Jonah went to give them this message. So there was some preparation of the soil, so to speak, just like God often does in our world. And what we have to be reminded of is that God will go to crazy lengths, do extravagant things, to get our attention, why? Because he's a God who loves us and wants us to experience his purpose and his plan for our life. So he's not shy about preparing the soil and he'll even use unlikely characters like a Jonah and unlikely messages like the message Jonah preached to change our life. If you haven't been with us the last number of weeks, let me give you a very brief recap. We've got this guy named Jonah who's a prophet. He's a a messenger of God to the nation of Israel. He's helped to expand the borders of Israel. He's been giving great proclamations. We learn about that in other uh, passages of scripture. And then when we get to the book of Jonah, God says, hey, Jonah, I've got a word for you. I want you to go speak to Nineveh, to these wicked people that many of them have maybe killed some of your family members. They're violent. They they do all sorts of detestable things. Like they skin people alive. Like they are a bad group of people. I want you to go give them a message. And Jonah's like, okay, God, not. And Jonah goes a complete opposite direction. He's supposed to go kind of like northeast and he goes like west and, and like south. He's gone. He's out of there. And in the midst of this journey, he literally pays for an entire ship, costs him a lot of money. He's heading out in the ocean and God causes a giant storm. He's with a bunch of non-believing sailors. These guys are freaking out. They're crying out to their gods. They're saying, who did this? They find out it's Jonah. Jonah owns up to it, says, it's my fault. If you throw me overboard, all this will stop. They don't want to, but it doesn't get any better. So they finally throw him overboard. The sea gets calm. They begin to worship and seek God. So the people that don't seek God, seek God. And the guy who's supposed to be seeking God is in the ocean. God has mercy on Jonah. He gets swallowed by a giant fish. Some believe they have been a whale. He's in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights. And while he's in this belly, he begins to cry out to God. Like Pastor Ray said, why does, it, why does the fish have to hit the fan before we see God last, last week? That was my favorite line, by the way. And all of a sudden, Jonah realizes the error of his ways that he too is is not following God's way. And so he repents and says, I'll go, I'll do what you want me to. The fish spits him up on dry land and he begins a crazy journey that probably took him about a whole month to go back to Nineveh. Jonah chapter two, verse nine, and this is what Jonah said when he proclaims to God and the fish, he'll go. He says, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Chapter three, verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the son the second time saying, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city and call out against it the message I tell you. And in the Hebrew, the word arise and go means, hey, get up now, sucker, and go. Because he's been waiting, he's been delaying. God's like, go right now to that city. And again, this city was a massive city. You can see a map on the screen. They pop it up there. It is like seven miles in circumference. It was a major, major deal. It took three days of proclamation for Jonah to cover the 120,000 people that lived in Nineveh. Verse three, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Verse four, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This whole sermon. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. You're like, what is sackcloth? It's the equivalent of, it was like a goat hair that was very rough, but it'd be like burlap. You're like putting burlap on. 
Why would they do this? Because they wanted to be agitated and uncomfortable. It was a reminder of their state spiritually. So they put on sackcloth, they have ashes around them, they're fasting, which is another form of affliction, to remind themselves of their need for God to intervene. From the greatest of them to the least of them, the word then reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published it throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil and from the violence that is in his hands. Remember, they're a violent culture. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. The statement I want you to be encouraged and challenged by this week, and it's been, I know, challenging me over the last number of weeks of preparing for this teaching, is simply this. God relents when we repent. God relents when we repent. Relenting is God showing compassion, God showing grace. What is grace? You and I receiving from God what we don't deserve, a second chance, hope, purpose, renewed vision in our life. We can experience his compassion. We can experience his relenting mercy in our life when we repent. There's three key things that happen in this passage that allow the nation of Nineveh to, the city of Nineveh and the nation of the Assyrians to turn back to God in this passage. Number one is when they are exposed to truth and proclamation. One of the ways we experience God's incredible relenting, his grace and his mercy in our life is by choosing to receive a proclamation, to receive a truth that is given to us. Now, let's be clear, Jonah was a reluctant prophet. Jonah's message actually, like if he went to like a seminary school and practiced this message, probably would have got an F minus. Like not a great message, not really clear, kind of vague. Like this was not a good representation of like how to lead people to repentance. Yet what's crazy is he ends up being more effective than any prophet in the Bible besides Jesus. 120,000 people. That's like twice the size of Brentwood almost. About 65,000 people in Brentwood. Almost twice the city of Brentwood repents and comes to God. That's a pretty good response, wouldn't you say? Yet his message is not that great. What does it show me? Well, first of all, it shows me that Jonah learned how to be obedient even when he didn't want to do something. It was an important part of our journey. But secondly, it shows me the power is in God and his message. It's not in me. It's not in me and you. Like, we can flaw and mess things up. I don't know how to share the God. Like, just start somewhere. Because if Jonah can be used by God, so can you and me. So it reminds me of God's power to intervene and the Holy Spirit's ability to work in any situation and circumstance. But the first key for these people in Nineveh is they had to hear a proclamation of truth. Romans 10 gives us an example. It says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about God unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the messengers, the feet who bring the good news. See, somebody has to go. Somebody has to proclaim. Nineveh was a wicked culture that needed truth, but it took Jonah who it didn't even like them. Imagine what God could do if you actually like people and you share the message. Yet God, you can imagine God with tears in his eyes, knowing that this proclamation would transform this community. And Jonah was looking with Jonah eyes at his situation, his anger at these people, they're his enemies. He doesn't want them to be transformed, but we know that God did not see them the same way. This is why it's so important for us to embrace the mission that we have at the Bay Church, which is loving God, loving people. I can argue with you that if you truly love God, you will begin to love people made in the image and likeness of God. If you truly love God, Jesus goes as far as to say, hey, if you like hate your brother or sister and say you love God, you're a liar. (laughs) 
If you truly love God, you're gonna begin to have a deeper heart for people. Joel chapter two puts it this way in the Old Testament. It says, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart. With fasting, weeping, and mourning, similar language. So rend your heart, tear your heart, not your garments, and return to the Lord your God. Why? For he is a gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion, and he relents from sending disaster. Part of our prayer should be, God, I want your heart. God, help me to see people like you see people. God, help me to, to, to cry out for those that, that you want to come to know you. God, give me a heart that mimics your heartbeat. God, help me to see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and have love for people, even people that drive me crazy. The truth is that what God had to bring Jonah to that he reminds us of today is that all of us are unworthy. None of us are worthy of salvation, of forgiveness, of the grace of Jesus. Yet God still chose to do an amazing thing in our life. Amen. We are broken vessels that get the opportunity each day to leak out grace and truth. None of us are perfect. We all have to come to the same foot of the same cross to find forgiveness and mercy in Jesus. None of us have a higher playing field. None of us were made right with God by how good we are. God relents when we repent, personally and corporately. So a question I'm asking myself that I ask you today is, are you open to correction? Are you open to correction in your life? Does truth went out even when it goes the opposite direction of what you wanna do? A deeper question, do you consider it your responsibility to share the good news, the gospel with other people? And a question that's really been challenging me over the last few weeks that I heard from someone is when's the last time that you cried over someone, shed tears over someone far from God, wanting to see somebody come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, wanting somebody to find forgiveness and hope? When's the last time that you really cried out to God for people in your world that are far from him? When's the last time? Pastor Timothy Keller, who passed away recently, an amazing man of faith, he had some strong words that I know have been convicting to me. He said, why don't we share Jesus with people? He said, there's four key reasons why. Pride, fear, pessimism, and indifference. Pride, because we say, they made bad choices, let them lie in it. Like, why do, why do I have to go and make things right? They're the ones that dug this hole. Fear. What if they think I'm a religious fanatic or freak and my friends make fun of me, my, my coworkers make fun of me, if I get isolated, what if I lose my job? Like, like fear. Pessimism, that person would never give their life to Jesus. Or indifference, it's not my problem anyway, so why am I worried about it? Let somebody else deal with it. The truth is if our heart doesn't break to share the good news with other people, then we need to have a loving heart check because God says, hey, if you love me, you'll love people made in my image and likeness. So what are a couple of simple ways we can share Jesus with other people? I wanna, I wanna give you four really simple ways that I know have been helpful in my own journey. Number one, pray, pray for them. Pray for people that have yet to begin a relationship with Christ. I keep an ongoing prayer list for me and I pray over these names on a regular basis, people that I want to come to know Christ, people that I'm close to and people that drive me crazy, both. And I know I won't tell you who's on the list. <laughs> But I pray over them regularly. And what it does is it changes my heart. That's why Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute because there's a heart change when I come to God. I can't do that in bitterness. God begins to transform me on the inside out and it opens up my mind to think about people far from God. So throughout the day, I have more opportunities to talk about him with other people. Begin by simply praying for them regularly. Second one, care more about them than what they think about you. Care more about them and their need than what they're gonna think about you. Not everybody's gonna receive the message great. Not everybody's gonna be excited about you sharing. Don't like slam over the head with the Bible, but look for the open doors that God has and share what God's doing in your life. Offer maybe a text, a text message of encouragement. Offer to pray for them. Very rarely do people turn down prayer. Look for opportunities to share with love because we care for people and we truly want them to experience the life transforming truth that changed us. Care more about them than what they think about you. Thirdly, 
Enter their world. Enter their world. Get into their world. Find ways to connect in community, to hear their story, because many of them are just really good, down-to-earth people who've yet to experience the truth of Jesus, just like you and me, before we knew him. Get into the world. This is one of the reasons I love coaching and being involved in the soccer and the community. I love being a part of like working out at gyms where I'm not in my own home, but I'm somewhere else because I'm around other people and I get to hear their story and I get to share life and they encourage me and I encourage them. And when the door opens, I have the opportunity to invite them into the greatest journey ever given to mankind. Get into their world. And fourth, be willing to take a risk. Be willing to take a risk. Be willing to step out of your comfort zone. Some people are like, well, what if like they get really mad and they hit me over the head with a stapler and they push me down on the ground, they kick me out of the office and I lose my job? Probably not gonna happen. But even if it does, God will provide you another job. He'll take care of you. Here is the reality. The things we freak out about the most, like, oh, what if, what if? Like 95% of the time, none of them happen. You notice that? Take a risk. I think of this beautiful man in Ethiopia. I was reading this story from this book called When Faith is Forbidden. There's, it's linked in your notes. So people who, who are all over the world sharing the good news of Jesus. And this guy lived in Ethiopia. He started sharing the gospel with a, a terrorist, uh, radical Islamic group. He was sharing over and over again. He kept getting beat up, almost lost his life, beat up. He goes back and he keep, and the guy's like, what is wrong with you? Why do you keep sharing with us? Like, we want to kill you. And he's like, because God loves you and he's got a plan for you. He's like, why are you angry? Because God loves you and he's got a plan for you. This guy's like, you are crazy. And so the guy starts having a conversation. And he surrenders his life to Jesus. And now he is a pastor in Ethiopia making significant impacts for the kingdom of God. His name is Pastor Haji. Again, that Christian in Ethiopia took an incredible risk. But think of the payout. Are you and I willing to take risks to share the good news of Jesus, because it was a major risk for Jonah. A major risk for Jonah. God relents when we repent. So first, we have to have a proclamation of truth. Secondly, we see, and you have this in your notes, when we respond to truth with repentance, God's grace and God's compassion comes our way. So first, we receive the proclamation. After we've received it now, our job is to respond with repentance. Repentance. We see this happen to the nation of Assyria, specifically in the city of Nineveh. We see that they respond with crazy, radical repentance. And here's what I want to encourage you with. Repentance is always a work of God. The Bible tells us we are open to repenting and going against our normal nature when God's Holy Spirit convicts us and works in our life. The Bible says these words in John 16, 8, and when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And here's the deal. Why is this so extraordinary? Because it goes against our human nature. What's our human nature? Pride. When things are pointed out to us, we want to point to somebody else. Prime example, Garden of Eden, Adam sins. He's like, Eve did it. Eve's like, no other people? The snake did it. The snake's like, I'm out of luck. You know, it's like there's, there's nobody else to blame, right? How many of you guys have children? Have you ever seen this phenomenon in your home? <laughs> Whose clothes are those? I have no idea. Your name's on them? <laughs> Whose stuff is this? I, I have no idea. Why do you have that in your hand? Oh. Right, like it's our human nature to try to cover these things up and God's going, no, 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 no. Like, like, like choose, repentance, part of it is owning what you've done. Sin is deceptive. It'll make promises it can't keep. It will cost you more than you can afford to pay, and it will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And the only way you can get freedom is through repentance, turning to God. We see this with the city of Nineveh. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Yet if we confess our sins, the good news is this, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is repentance? It's you and I owning the fact that we don't have what it takes. Owning the fact that we fall short, owning the fact that we've missed it at times, owning the fact that we've hurt the heart of God with our behavior and saying, God, I can't do it, but you can. I'm so thankful for your life, your death, and your resurrection, Jesus. Because through you, I have hope, I have joy, I have purpose. And that's the role of repentance. 
I've talked to you about personal repentance before when I've taught here. And, and one of the things I do on a regular basis, I get down in a chair in the morning and I just pray and I say, God, is there anything in me that doesn't please you? Anything you want to talk to me about? Sometimes nothing comes to mind. I'm just, thank God, I'll worship him. Other times he'll be like, yeah, remember that conversation with so-and-so? It's like, oh, God, forgive me. And now I'm going to go and make that right with that person. Oh, you remember that thing you did? And that's my moment of confession, of, of turning to God, listening, turning. That's private repentance, personal repentance. The other one is corporate repentance. This is one we don't talk about as much in our culture. Corporate repentance is when you and I look in our world, we look in our community, maybe looking into the news, and we go, God, I see some things that don't line up with who you are. And we, by ourselves, or we gather together other believers, and we say, God, would you forgive us? God, would you restore your image and your likeness in our culture and our communities? God, would you have your way? Would you bring healing? Would you bring repentance? Would you bring life? And we corporately confess. We're gonna do a little bit of that at the end of service today. I'm just gonna lead us in a, a prayer of corporate confession because that's part of what the Bible is talking about, the beauty of repentance personally and corporately. I love that the king intensifies this and he makes sure that the whole city knows what's at stake. The words of Jonah are actually pretty powerful. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That word overthrown in Hebrew can mean turn over like end of life or turn around like new beginning. So Jonah said, hey, listen, 40 days and something's gonna happen. Either it's gonna turn over and it's done, y'all toast, or it can turn around and you can experience newness of life. That's a lot like the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, yes, you're all sinners falling short of the glory of God. That sounds bad. The wages of sin is death. That sounds bad. But the free gift is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You can find hope. You can find purpose. You can find forgiveness. So when God sees you, he no longer sees you in your sins. He sees his son, Jesus, if you choose to walk in relationship with him. It can either turn us over if we reject Christ, or it can turn us around and we can experience newness of life. These Ninevites had an incredible thing happen because they had such a genuine, heartfelt repentance from all their wicked ways, especially their violent behavior, the text tells us. And there's four things that I believe we can learn from their repentance that helps us today in our own personal journey and corporately. Number one, this is incredibly important, they chose to embrace God's message. They chose to fully embrace God's message given through Jonah. Even though it was a very hard message, a very difficult message, they embraced it. Secondly, because of that message, what did they do? They repented like we talked about and they confessed their sin. They named it. They said, hey, we've been violent. We've been a, a, a wicked culture. Forgive us. Put on sackcloth. Put on ashes. Let's pursue God because we know what we've done is wrong. Thirdly, they humbled themselves. They become uncomfortable. They fasted. They forsook food. I mean, you know God is moving when all the animals in the kingdom are also seeking God, right? <laughs> you see that this passage, you've read that, that, like the cows are crying out to God. You're like, what is going on here? But there's a genuine, humble repentance. And fourth, and this is super important, they changed their behavior. It wasn't just like, oh, this sounds good. Oh, yeah, we should do this. I'll put on some sackcloth, I'll put on some ashes. No, they actually changed their behavior. And no longer did they walk in violent ways. It's important to understand that your level and my level of repentance helps to prepare me for God's measure of grace in my life. And the last thing I'll mention about repentance before we go to our last point today is simply this. Repentance is not meant to be simply a moment. It's meant to be a lifestyle. This is, this is so important. Here's why. 150 years later, Nineveh was completely destroyed and wiped off the map because of their sin. Completely destroyed and wiped off the map because of their sin. Why? Because they quit repenting. They quit seeking God and they just went their own way long term. So this was a beautiful moment, but what would have sustained it is a lifestyle of repentance and turning and seeking God. And God challenges us with this same truth. God will relent when we repent. So first, we hear a proclamation. Second, we repent to receive God's compassion. And third, we understand this truth. We remember that God responds to our response with compassion. 
Verse 10 says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it. Now listen, you, if you repent of something you've been doing today, you give it to God, that doesn't mean there's no other consequence. There could be some, some similar things that just have to play their way out, but God forgives you, restores you, and you're made right with God, healed, and he begins to walk you on a journey of restoration and hope and purpose. But that can't happen if we don't have repentant hearts. This is a principle that God responds to how we respond to him. We see this in Jeremiah 18, seven, it says these words, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck it and break it down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. On the reverse side, verse nine, and if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I had intended to do to it. This is a clear pattern. God is saying, hey, listen, if these people will turn to me, I will turn to them. If, they, if I originally said I would turn to them and they reject me, I am gonna have consequences for them. As a nation, we have to remind ourselves of this truth. We have to remind ourselves that we need to continue to seek and to pursue and to love God. You may say, well, Jason, if God's a God of grace and he's a God of mercy, but he's also a God of justice, like how does this work? Like, isn't there a consequence for what we've done? There is. And here's the beautiful story. The Bible says that all of us are sinners falling short of God's glory. And it says that we deserve death. So God, knowing that, sent his son Jesus to the earth who lived a perfect sinless life he showed us how to love God and to love people. He didn't ever wrong anyone. And then he was brutally murdered upon a cross, taking on our sin. It says, he who knew no sin became or took on our sin so that in him we could be made right with God. The justice of God, the wrath of God for sin was poured out on the son, Jesus. And that's why we're able to experience the grace and mercy of Jesus, even though we've sinned. You maybe know this verse of scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. But it goes on to say in verse 17, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. And then Jesus in his own words, we go to wrap in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40 said, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, in the tomb before he resurrected. Verse 41, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But Jesus says, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. That's speaking of the grace and mercy of Jesus before his death and resurrection. And Jesus says to each of us in this room today, hey, listen, I love you. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. I have a desire for you, an intent for you. I have a journey for you, for your community, for your family, for your city, for your state, for your nation, for our world. Will you get on the mission with me, Jesus says. Will you choose to come to me in personal repentance and seek me? Will you choose to come corporately and seek me and imagine what God will do when we corporately and individually say, God, I will choose to live a life of repentance, a life of repentance personally and in community. Can you imagine how that would impact the world in which we live? How that would affect our friends and our coworkers, our family, our marriages, our communities, our nation, our world. I believe it would change everything. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here today and you say, Jason, man, as you, as you talk about this, this truth, maybe you've yet to begin a personal relationship with Jesus. You've yet to get on the journey with him and follow him. And I want to encourage you this moment, if that is you and you want to begin a personal relationship journey with Jesus, nobody else looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, to afford you a little bit of privacy. If that's you and you want to begin that journey right now, would you just raise your hand quietly? I'd love to pray for you today. Thank you so much. I see you. Thank you. 
Thank you. See a few of you. Thank you. Thank you. Could you guys all together pray with me out loud along with these people that have raised their hands so we can encourage them in their faith journey? Would you just repeat these words to me? Say, Lord Jesus, thank you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. And right now, I choose to follow you. Thank you for newness of life. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's clap for those that began that relationship journey with Jesus. And if you made that decision, I want to encourage you. We've got a team of people that will be up here afterwards that have a Bible for you and some material to encourage you in your journey with Christ. The greatest decision you could ever make. We're now going to finish with a song today. We're going to do something a little bit different. You can stand, you can sit, whatever you're comfortable doing. I want to just encourage you over the next three or four minutes to just say, God, search me. Is there anything in my life that maybe I'm unaware of or things I've been putting off or maybe just something you want me to get right? And God, I, I give this moment to you. And if anything comes to your mind as we're praying, just surrender it to him. There may be a conversation that needs to follow this week with somebody. But let's take some time to just search our heart. And whether something comes to mind or not, let's take this moment to worship him, to surrender to a life of repentance. And then we'll finish with a corporate prayer of repentance together as a church family, believing for God to work in our community. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and seek him.